Good morning, everybody. Paul Iander with you on this Thursday, the final Thursday of June. How quickly this year's gone. We are halfway through the year of our Lord 2024. And there's so much to do still. So many things to dig into. So many things to talk about. Instagram Hill is here on the ones and twos as always. So about last night, the NBA draft. Dig in. I, it, we say on this program, we stay up late so you don't have to. That first round ended at about 11-20. 11-20 with the left-handed shooter from Creighton going number 30 to the Boston Celtics. Baylor Shireman, who everybody seemed to love. Big, big pick, right? Big pick at number 30. Second round begins this afternoon, 4 o'clock. Highlights during the drive, and we'll see where a couple of guys go. But before we move on to that, a couple of things. Four ACC players taken. First one off the board. Bub Carrington out of Pittsburgh, right? Pitt, lottery pick. Second player off the board, this guy, Adam Silver, the first guy from Duke to go to the NBA this season. And with the 16th pick in the 2024 NBA draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Jared McCain from Duke University. So there it is. Jared McCain, first off the board midway through that first round. Well done to him. Not the guy we thought, though, that was going to go early. Not the guy. Every mock draft, and I bought into it, too. Not Kyle Filipowski. But you look at all the names that came off prior to him, which include other big men. Zach Eady going a lot higher than most people expected at number nine. Kling Kong, who ended up with the Trailblazers at number seven. And the Charlotte Hornets with this dude at number six. Oh, okay. I I see see what you're doing. Yeah, see? I see what you were doing there. Go click. With the sixth pick in the 2024 NBA draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Tijian Salon from Cholet, France. From Cholet, Basquet. Tijian Salon to the Hornets, of which many people are suggesting it's six feet, nine inches tall, and a mere eight. 18 years old, Graham, will be a project for the Hornets. I mean, he's only uh, he's got pretty good size right now, and he's only he's only going to continue to grow. You and I were just talking off air. What, like, I mean, by the time he's 21 or something, he could be like close to seven foot. Sure. This seemed like um, this is the Home Depot draft. Let's call it that, the Home Depot draft, where a lot of things are going to have to be a little bit of DIY, right? We weren't drafting professionals. We were drafting potential to be professionals this is not by any means the star-studded showtime draft that a lot of people had thought of but you know the names you've heard some of these names right except like the top two guys this wasn't the Victor Weminyama of last season this was the Zach Richache for the Atlanta Hawks who's excited about playing there it was Alex Saar also an international player going to the Washington Wizards. And then you get into some of the homegrown talent with Reed Shepard of Kentucky, who was either going to stay or going to go because Mark Pope was the new coach and dad was a legacy, but he goes third to the Rockets. And Stephen Castle from UConn going to the San Antonio Spurs. But what's missing from this entire first round, and it wasn't unexpected, certainly, Bronny James. Bronny James is a day two. So a lot of the focus was, will he go round one? To be honest, there wasn't a lot of buzz about him going round one. But round two, could Bronny James be the guy? And also, the DJs, right? NC State, day two. Day two guys. Playing themselves into day two because of some of the press that they've been getting. But some of the press that was missing, and some of the press that was also gotten, was for Duke's Kyle Filipowski, who towards the end of the draft, we don't have the clip here, but towards the end of the draft, it was talked about, And there was this discussion, Graham, about whether or not it was a good thing or what kind of pressure there was on the players who were invited to the draft but were still sitting in the green room as picks 27, 28, and 29, and 30 were being announced. Now, one of those guys in the draft room was Isaiah Collier. He was able to come up. He was sitting, quote, unquote, in the green room. Basically, it's a it was if you didn't watch it last night, the green room actually is just this big flat area in front of the stage. 
and they come walking up and they shake the hands with Adam Silver. They take the picture. They get their hat. Right. They get their hat and they're done. They say there's literally a person there that says, okay, put the hat on when you get on to the stage. Isaiah Collier was one of the last guys sitting in that green area who had been waiting all night and finally, just after 11 o'clock, got picked by the Utah Jazz. Ryan Dunn, Ryan Dunn, for those of you who might remember him from the Virginia Cavaliers, who plays tons of defense, and that's what they talked about, got came out of the crowd, came down from the came down from the stands with his parents, Seth Rollins style. Yes, he he came he came straight out of the crowd. It was a street fight. Denver Nuggets picked him at twenty eight, but still sitting in that green area it was a very tall. All-American by the name of Kyle Filipowski. And I wonder if this is about fit or if we, as a group, as a collective here in the triangle, and certainly as the media, and certainly Kyle himself, got sold a monster bill of goods. And he may not have had a choice leaving Duke. He had the hip surgery. He had to run it back for the second season. That was undeniable. But someone told him during this year, or someone kept feeding him that, listen, if you keep stacking up the stats, you keep playing to your potential, and you keep playing the way you play, you are going to be a first-round NBA lock for sure. And the story that has been moving forward right now is all about Cooper Flagg, who has yet to put on a Duke uniform officially on a court and record a stat, being a top three pick next year. And already trending nationally during the the <laughs> night before the draft. We're already talking about next year's guy, but this year's guy who came out after the season, loved his time in Durham, did the whole song and dance. Yeah, but, you know, I'm blessed to be here. Thanks, John Shire. Thanks, Coach Kaka. Thanks, all you. Thanks, all of you here in the triangle. Declares for the NBA draft and does not get selected in the first round. Did we get sold? Or did he get sold? a monster bill of goods to where he would have been better off taking the run that Armando Baycott made and just continue to play in college until that stock made sense. Because this year, again, I just called it the Home Depot draft, right? This is a DIY, build-it-up kind of draft. Not a lot of – I mean, there's plenty of pro-ready. Everybody's pro-ready when you when you play. They, they tell you that. But did they tell Kyle something different? And to temper your expectations? Because this was the whole point of last night. Is it okay to be invited? Is it okay to be invited to this green room thing with the expectations across the board, even at the top league offices, when they put this list of players together? You know what? All these guys are going to walk up onto the stage tonight. This is going to happen. And instead, he's waiting on a round two. It is very surprising that Filipowski fell out of the first round entirely. I mean, coming into the draft, he was regarded as one of the best offensive players in this class and ranked number 16, actually, on CBS's sport, CBS Sports Big Board. But now he's put with the opportunity of whoever drafts him in the second round, they'll probably be getting one of the most talented seven-footers in the class. So I look at who was drafted before him, and then you go, okay, needs or whatever it is, best player available. If the Nuggets were certainly looking for front court help, Outside of Nikola Jokic, Michael Porter Jr., I'm not sure Ryan Dunn was the player of Virginia, and this is no shade on Ryan Dunn, but at this point in the draft, at the end of the first round, like someone told someone told Flip, "Hey, you're going to make it," because I when when Jerry McCain got picked at 16, I was like, "Oh, okay," but Flip was the first one to stand up. John Shire was there, uh, much like Dan Hurley was there for his UConn guys. Shire was there for his Duke guys. But they just sat and sat and sat. And so did we believe it so much or wanted to believe it so much that Kyle Filipowski was this dominant player that was going to play in the NBA? And did he get filled or did his advisors, did his family or whoever it is who said, you know what, you're good. You're good after this year. You don't need to run it back anymore. John Shire's already filled the class. I mean, not that you wouldn't welcome him back legitimately after last year's performance and to being able to play with other big men. You know, he joked about not being double teamed. Like, there is this small little hint, and I think it's remote, that Kyle Filipowski will not be drafted in this second round. Because is it about fit? Is it actually about finding the best players available? Because all he does is slide up the board. 
slide up the board. Like, he wasn't very far off the board to begin with when it came in the first round, but now other players started jumping him. And I'm like, as the Boston Celtics, I take Baylor Shireman, and the Boston Celtics don't really need anything or whatnot, except they got to figure out if Chris Tapps Porzingis can come back healthy. Could they have used a seven foot shooter in that system? A guy who you know can pass the ball? A guy who you know can shoot the ball? Who's a decent rim protector? That's the bit. Somebody got in his head and said, You're a first rounder. And the NBA, the NBA pumped that juice. Man, they gave him all the smoke. Dude, we're gonna invite you the first we're gonna invite you Thursday or Wednesday night. Wednesday night first round. We're only doing one round tonight. We want you there. You're going to walk up on that stage, take that hat from Adam Silver. It's going to be great. You're going to have the best moment ever in your life. And instead, you got to stick. And I don't know, Graham, is Flip, in your eyes, a guy that's going to put a chip on his shoulder going, dude, you all told me I was going to be first round. Now I'm second round. The thirty team, the 29 teams that passed over me, screw you. I'm going to come out and tear it up. Is he that kind of guy? Kyle Filipowski is a great basketball player. We saw what he was able to do in his two seasons at, at Duke. But I remember us having previous conversations in this show, First Jump, where there were times, you want to talk about having the chip on your shoulder, I remember there were times we were questioning how passionate or how aggressive Kyle Filipowski would play in games because sometimes when you when you watched him, and especially going back to that first game against North Carolina at the Dean Dome this past season, Armando Baycott kind of had his way with him. I wonder if it was beyond the ability which causes him to slide out of the first round. Is it the the trip on the court? Is it the court storming? Is there an ability to handle some of the pressure and maturity and whatnot? Again, you're a player at Duke. You have all these intangibles. All eyes are on you. These all come with the bit. Like, that is going to war in ACC basketball. When you are here in this conference, you have to buy in every single way because you are overanalyzed, because you are on television, you are being broadcast on radio, you are on social media all the time. So any little tidbit that throws up red flags or any small little tweak or whatever it is, like it's magnified a hundred times over. But I keep going back and wonder. If he and his advisors and his family got sold a bill of goods, saying you are a first-rounder, bona fide, you are going top of this class. And instead, now we're talking about him, well, you think Bronny James might go before him? <laughs> do you or think, DJ Horn. DJ Horn, DJ Burns, who worked out for the Pacers, who have back-to-back picks in the middle of the second round. Harrison Ingram as well. There's a lot of talent still out there. A lot of talent. And I wonder if that talent rises above what Kyle Filipowski offers to other basketball teams. This is the strangest, strangest argument and conversation you will probably hear about the NBA today when it comes to the draft. But you have to wonder. You scratch your head and go, why is he still sitting there? Why did the NBA offer the invitation for him to show up in the first round when all 30 NBA teams said, He's not ready for us at this time. All right, folks, coming up next, the smoke is certainly clearing. The Marty Natchez trade finally coming in for a landing. Next up on 99.9 The Fan. Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan delivered by Talk It Out NC. Philadelphia 76ers selected Duke's Jared McCain with the 16th overall pick in the 2024 NBA Draft, making McCain the first Duke player in this year's draft selected. 76ers general manager Elton Brand, who also played basketball at Duke, is ultimately responsible for the selection of McCain. Veteran forward Alex Morgan won't be going to the Paris Olympics after surprisingly being left off the roster by U.S. national team coach Emma Hayes. Morgan, a three-time Olympian and two-time Women's World Cup winner, was the most notable absence of the 18-player list announced Wednesday by Hayes. 
Centennial Authority, the owner of PNC Arena, is expected to give final approval this morning to a 20-year lease with the Carolina Hurricanes agreement for the organization to develop land around the arena. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. So late yesterday, started getting some word that this final, final, this this thing took off right after the postseason, right? That Marty Natchez, an unrestricted or unrestricted free agent, would certainly entertain a trade, right? And that kept building and building and building, weeks upon weeks upon weeks, right? The the air got sucked out of the room. We weren't worried about Brett Pesci, Brady Shea, Tabu Teravine, and you know a little bit of Jake Gensel here what to do about Seth Jarvis, because we got a couple of nuggets, right? We get a Jalen Chatfield deal. Nobody thinks about it. Marty Natchez, this plane has been circling for so long and has been refueled in the air so many times that it feels like it's finally coming in for a landing. And I'm going to take you back just to three days ago. There was an uh, article in the uh, Czech sports site Hokej CZ. Reporter Dominic Dubovsky talked with Marty Natchez, talked about... Uh, the trip and uh, the 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 World Cup, the uh, the Euro Cup, and playing in the uh, World Cup of Hockey, and then also he's attended some uh, soccer games and whatnot. And he talked a couple of things about. He said talked about rating his season. How do you rate your season? Asking Marty Natchez. He goes up down. It wasn't the best. I'm not happy with it, nor completely disappointed. Um, couldn't have experienced the great atmosphere in the whole experience. He says, why didn't you advance in the playoffs? You fell out of the Rangers. We haven't played very well since the start of the playoffs. We had a good team. We've been playing the same hockey since the first game of the regular season. We were ready for it, unfortunately. So here's where we go a little bit further down the path here. Marty Natchez asked about, your game load was less with Carolina. Is it hard to accept? Quote, yeah, it's not ideal. I was not among the key players. I would like to improve it for the next season, both from my point of view and overall. I know that in these situations, I feel the best on the ice, and I would like to play in them. I have to perform for it. I hope it will get better. This is translated from Czech, by the way, so this is not verbatim, but this is the translation from Czech. Quote, unquote, this is about a trade and negotiating a new contract. The question was asked by the reporter. There is talk of a possible exchange. How do you feel about it? Here's the translated quote. I'm ready for anything. Carolina has the rights to me. I don't know what will happen. I've talked to them about it. They know what I would imagine. We'll see. I'd like to say more, but I can't. And when it came to talking to Carolina about having a bigger position on the team, here's the translation. The agent and I told them of our vision and what we wanted. We'll see if that changes. That was three days ago. Mm. Yeah, to me, it just feels like the writing's on the wall. From everything that we've heard this offseason, going back to Maureen Nages' dad saying that he wanted to be more on the first power play unit, to everything that Peter Morazic said about the former team as well, and then everything that we just heard in this quote, it, it just feels like maybe this relationship, not that it was ever broken to begin with, but I, I just don't see this relationship continuing between the Carolina Hurricanes and Maureen Nages. And maybe it's a good thing because, yeah, his production has gone down a little bit as far as how he's been able to contribute. And no NHL player, no professional sport, or no professional athlete ever wants to go through something like that with their professional team. Marty Natchez, read social media, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Paul Eihander here, that's Instagram Hill, next up here on 99.9 The Fan. He's 25, he has TikTok. Within that article, he talks about uh, getting information from his agent, but also talking about how he understands where he is right now. He says, quote, Only the agent calls me when he hears the news. There is a lot of speculation. Listen to this. If you were to read Twitter or watch the news, you would feel like you are going to another 15 teams every day. I stick to what the agent and I discuss. He knows. He knows. This is not smoke. This is not fire. This is not rumor or conjecture. He knows what's up. They know what they want. Carolina Hurricanes know what they want, too. So what do they want? So you're like, Paul, you teased us up with the smoke and the landing of the planes and using the analogies, and where are you going with this? Last night, 
there are two possibilities, two that have crept up a little bit more to the forefront now that every agent, every GM, and every insider are now huddled in Las Vegas ahead of the NHL draft's first round tomorrow. Marty Natchez being dangled by two different teams right now. One of them is the New Jersey Devils. This would be within the Metropolitan Division. The New Jersey Devils would give up their number 10 pick in this year's NHL draft. Here's the extra part of it. That's where the deal starts. Insider Frank Cervelli reporting that the deal would start with the 2024 pick at number 10, which how it works is if you announce the trade, they would be picking on your behalf or they would be able to make the swap. That would happen in the next 24 hours. Could be a draft night trade, but remember what I said there. It starts with the number 10 pick. The other one out there that's been floated just as hard, and apparently this is this is Elliot Friedman, this is Pierre Lebrun talking about what could be moving forward. A lot of sit-downs again happening in Las Vegas where the, the site of this year's NHL draft. The other team that's in play, outside of all the rumors of the Winnipegs and the Chicagos who could dangle money and perhaps Los Angeles and whatnot, but the money, you know, money and players and prospects and things like that. Again, we're talking more of a hockey trade, player for player and assets. That the other team involved that's actually dangling something is the Buffalo Sabres. Buffalo Sabres also within the Eastern Conference, dangling their pick as well. And apparently this is heated up so much that it could be one of these two teams. Buffalo offering its number 11 pick, starting with that. Now, is it a ton of draft assets? Do Does the shedding of Marty Natchez, and again, we're talking about restricted free agents that, that still have to be signed, right? We're, we haven't talked about Seth Jarvis. We'll get to that in a bit. We haven't talked about Jack Drury either, and we also haven't talked about the unrestricted free agents too. But those are the two teams right now that seem to be in position to make something happen with the Carolina Hurricanes. The Devils got a lot of traction, a lot of smoke about that one. Buffalo as well. We also talked about earlier this week about the buyout of possibly Jeff Skinner and a reunion with Carolina. Certainly could be a possibility. At least he knows the system, right? But it would have to come out at a straight. It would have to come at a buyout price. Because the Carolina Hurricanes can't take any can't take a ton of salary on right now as this goes. So we know this trade is coming in for a landing, folks. It's coming. We're down to the Sabres and Devils. We're eliminating the Blackhawks. It's not Chicago. There's a wild card with Vancouver. Vancouver did a salary dump yesterday. Uh, they got a pick. Uh, to, uh, to But they did a deal with Chicago. So they sent Mikheyev, uh, Ilya Mikheyev. Uh, second round pick. Mikheyev is like one of the fastest skaters in the league, but he's coming. He's had some injuries, and they have a pending UFA that they unloaded too. So the Canucks, while they're going to retain a little bit of salary, trying to clear a little bit of cap. If it's not for Gensel, it's probably to try to resign Elias uh, Lindholm, their center. The only reason I brought the Blackhawks is because it feels like they're just doing anything they can to get somebody to play alongside Connor Bedard. They need a stud. And yesterday I was doing Storm Tracker on the drive with Tim Donnelly, which you can listen to every afternoon right here on The Fan from 3 to 6. I was talking about how they have plenty of cap space to skip a trade entirely by trying to offer or trying to sign Natchez to an offer sheet. And what's interesting about that is that would essentially be calling Eric Tolsky's bluff from what he said on our programs just last week. This is going to be a very, very quick 24 hours. This is happening, though, folks. This is happening. There's just, there's really, really no way around it. The Marty Natchez is just, we have to resign ourselves to it. This He knows it. He knows it. I got three pages of translated article in front of me right now. He's well aware of what's happening right now. Well aware. 